for welcome everybody this is our class on P power of magic so magic and fantasy in action scenes mostly focused on prose and we actually had already started the class and had already done all the intro stuff and gotten pretty deep, deep into it so i kind of just want to go back to where we were and not restate everything we already did so we're talking currently about the differences that between action scenes in books versus in movies or these visual mediums um, and the different interesting things that you can do. Um, and what are some of those things that uh, we can more uniquely focus on in books that we wouldn't have the ability to do in, in uh, movies, shows, or comics? The first things we talked about were you can see the character's thought process, plans, and just their the way that they are um, perceiving things going on. We can see their emotions, and we can sort of suffuse the description of everything that is going on through that character's experience. For instance, like we could... Um, uh, if your character's in the middle of an artillery bombardment, maybe they can barely even string a sentence together as they are trying to run for cover, right? And we can use that to sort of show these little fragments or snippets of images, or it could be that the battle they're in is just too overwhelming for them, and they don't even remember much of it. They just remember these little kind of uh, pictures or sounds or smells or things like that. So we have access to more sensory details that we than we do in films as well. Did we did we mention that already, Amanda? The uh, fact that we can access things beyond just sight and sound. We can like do. I mean, I was hinting at that, but I didn't draw. I didn't generalize to that degree. I was just thinking, well, we can hear their thoughts and strategies in the fight itself. But yeah, it's like we're not limited to what we see. That's a better, more that covers more ground. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think you're, yeah. I think you're right on, and we should of course mention just like things like smell and taste, right? Um, which you just can't right. do in a movie. But if your character is in a book and they're getting their face squashed into the mud, and they, we can actually describe the taste of the, you know, the lily pads that are flooding their, that are like getting stuck in the back of their throat, or we can talk about the smell of the carnage and the burning hair and all these things that we would just not really have access to. You can also use those things in your magic systems somehow, too. You can say, you know, the smell of sulfur is a clear indication that dark magic has been used recently in this room. Your character can learn that, and your audience can learn that through them. And we can just do those things that in, in a movie would be trickier to convey through just images. Um, some other advantages we have in prose over fiction. Um, there will never be a stunt too dangerous. There will never be a sequence too expensive. There will never be a monster too big to render realistically. You can do more abstract, crazy, and visual things in prose. I, I, I should say, things that would, if they were rendered in visuals, be much more difficult to fully to, 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 to make the right way or to, to, to portray correctly. In prose, we can kind of um, do a lot with a little. The imagination of the audience fills in the gaps. Um, we're going to read a little bit from um, the Margaret Rogerson book, Enchantment of Ravens, today, which has some action scenes with spirits and creatures that... It says things like, at, at one moment, it was a white stag. And then at the next moment, it was a twisting mass of writhing tentacles. And it's like, in a movie, what would that even look like exactly? What do you mean? It's like, it's always sort of shape-shifting between different kind of creatures or forms. It may not necessarily work. It's sort of saying, like in the book, it's sort of saying that it's all of these things at once or sometimes simultaneously, sometimes cycling very rapidly between these different forms. That would just be hard to pull off. It's hard to visualize correctly. So, more abstract, more expensive, more difficult things can be shown in your action scenes. Whereas in a movie or show, you always have to keep in the back of your mind. Okay, how would people realistically actually pull this scene off? Um, you can also do stuff that might just kind of look dumb in a movie, right? Like, I just saw a really cool painting the other day that I'm going to link in the chat. Um, is that the one? Nope, that's the wrong one. Uh, didn't I post it in the fantasy chat? Maybe I can just describe it if I can't find it. I thought I had it saved. Might have deleted it. Um, oh, is this it? Let me try the very first one. Here it is. Okay, so let me share this in the chat. So this I just thought was a really cool painting. Um, can I portray this on the slideshow as well? I think I can. So what's happening here is that we have a sort of canyon with a river flowing through it. Let me bring it up. Here we go. There's a canyon with a river flowing through it. And um, as the... Uh, water splashes down to the basin at the bottom, it sort of manifests as people wearing robes, white robes that are, you know, the same color as the water. And this, to me, made me think, oh, that'd be really cool if in a book there was like a, maybe I'm, I was just imagining what could justify this or what could be going on here. There's a group of mages that the way they travel very quickly is they sort of turn themselves into the water, or they, they step into the river and they just flow along with the current until they reach their destination. 
and they sort of spill out and manifest and, and reshape into physical form as they reach the end. Now, in a movie or TV show, this would maybe look stupid, right? But unless it was portrayed just right, unless you unless you had the exact right CGI, um, it, it would be a really expensive amount of CGI to get this looking right. There's no way you could cheaply show this and have it work or make sense, right? But in a book, it's really kind of cool, actually. Like, I, I totally can see how this works. And obviously, the fact that we just have a still image of it here allows us to, again, use our imagination to sort of fill in those gaps. And that's just a really powerful tool. The, the ability to, like, the fact that your audience's imagination is one of the key brushes in your uh, brush arsenal. <laughs> what do they call it? There's got to be a word for that. Uh, the, it, your tool set, your, your, your artist belt. The fact that the audience's imagination is one of those key tools that you have to access is a really powerful part of what makes prose writing so much different and so much more effective at doing certain things than you can do in film and TV. Nacho or Amanda, anything else that comes to your mind in terms of just stuff that can be done differently between movies and books in action? I just think we can, in, in movies, you can, I think I already said it, but we can see the emotions more of multiple people. I mean, unless you're doing narrator omniscient in a book, you mm -hmm. tend to stay in the protagonist's head. Whereas in a movie, it's possible to like, you know, move from person to person's experience in the fight. Like in Lord of the Rings in the, in the Mount Mori, Mines of Moria and the Trolls Attack, you know, we get mm -hmm. close on lots of the characters. Um, and I guess, I mean, he's omniscient narrator, but in generally in a, in a close first person, like Harry Potter, we're going to mostly be experiencing the emotion of Harry yeah. as opposed to seeing lots of reactions of different people. This is a good point. And it's funny because this is one of those things that novelists are going to say is a strength of novels and movie the screenwriters are going to say is a strength of movies because they're both looking at it from, I agree. It, from exactly. opposite angles. They're like, a novelist yeah. would be like, a mo movies are so limiting. You, can, you can't you can show what's going on in the character's head besides just a quick glance at what their facial expression or whatever. And a uh, screenwriter is going to be like, books are so limiting. You have to go into so much detail about what everyone's thinking and feeling it all the time. I just want to show them doing stuff. Um, right. So it's funny, like that's that's why it's I think it's worth studying both because then you can take the best parts of both, and you don't have to be limited by either. You can use you can use both of the mediums for whatever advantages they present, and really focus on those. Okay, um, thank you for the comments, guys. Um, I think I want to look a little at um, let's see, let's look at limitations, components, and cost. And then some ways of maybe think we can maybe think of some variations on these or different ways that we could solve these problems or ways that these might come up in a fight or action sequence specifically. I think after that, I want to get into set pieces, A defeats, B defeats, C, and then I'll do a reading from the Margaret Rogerson book. And we will talk about that scene and the ways that it sort of uses the advantages of the prose medium to, for, to best effect. Okay, so we'll start with limitations. So we have to always be asking this question of what can the magic never do? Um, and we should, of course, know the things it can do, but it's sometimes in, to your benefit to leave things intentionally sort of open. And we don't want to strictly say every single thing that the magic can do, because then that might, in certain circumstances, just limit the tools that your character has access to, right? Or limit the number of things that they can do, especially if we're using sort of like artifact-based magic, in which case your character has a... It, the magic that they're getting is deriving from objects that they get. You have a ring that can turn you invisible. You have a wand that can shoot five lightning bolts. You know, if, if we can limit things that much if you want, but sometimes if we say your character is a mysterious wizard and we don't know fully what they're capable of, it gives you more room to be to make things up in the future as you go along and to sort of discover stuff that they can do. Um, maybe you yourself, the author, are discovering stuff alongside the other characters as they sort of realize the limits and, and, and extents of this character's power, but then it can cause problems for you if you don't too strictly define what are the limitations of that power. And limitations almost always will give you more interesting stuff to work with than just direct powers will. So we should ask just these basic questions. What can this magic never do? And every magic works differently, and some sub subset systems of magic are going to have more limitations than others. I think if we look at something like video games and card games, then they have really easily and strictly defined limitations on what different types of magic can do. Let's look at Magic the Gathering, for instance, which is going to be a chromatic-based magic system that's going to have sort of five different separate colors. We have white, black, blue, green, and uh, 
uh what did i miss white black blue green <laughs> wait there's one more <laughs> how am i forgetting a basic color uh magic the gathering colors white red red green white black blue what did i leave out okay so yeah we've got those five basic colors um and um each one is going to represent a different sort of genre of magic um let me see if there i think there was let me just bring up a diagram of it all right here we go so this is say so we have uh, can i find a bigger picture that's not such terrible quality this one's a little easier to read Okay, so this is just a simple breakdown of the five different kind of genres of magic within Magic the Gathering. We have green magic that's linked to life and drawing its power from nature. We have white that draws its power from order and is sort of usually going to be focused on protection or judgment. We have blue, which is magic that is derived from intellect and is often used for deception or intrigue. We have black that's drawing its power from death, decay, chaos, and disorder. And that's going to be uh, spells that kill people, spells that cause things to rot, um, spells that are, can be very powerful, but often will require a blood sacrifice of some kind on the part of the user, which manifests in both the fiction and also the game elements, where it's like, you have to pay five life to use that spell, but it is going to give you a more powerful effect than it would have otherwise. We have red that's going to be drawing its power from chaos and fury. It's going to be pow powers that are based on, you know, shooting lightning bolts at people, blasts of lava, um, making people really strong, uh, stuff that is kind of all in that in that world of strength and anger. Okay, so within your world, you might have a sort of chromatic system like this. I think elemental-based systems were really popular in the 2000s and early 2010s and have kind of fallen out of favor a little bit because I think we've seen, after Avatar The Last Airbender and things like this, people have seen every single version of chromatic magic that is out there. That's not to say you can't do it or you can't find some fascinating new way to play it, but I would guess I would just say don't feel like you have to stick with something like this just because Magic has it or D&D has it or Pokemon has it. I mean, what are our, our Pokemon types we have here, right? We have eight, 18 different ones, I think. 3, 6, 9, 12. Yeah, 18. We have water, ice, fighting, fire, electric poison, grass, dragon, bug, ground, ghost, flying, rock, psychic, dark, steel, fairy, and normal. Normal is maybe kind of a weird word to use there, considering it's still a pocket monster that fits into a ball in your pocket, but okay, normal type, whatever you say. So a lot of systems will sort of categorize their different powers, effects, creatures, or wizards or magic users into these different sort of schools of things that they have access to, the ways that they use these powers, or the th you know just like the stuff that they are ultimately capable of. Um, and we can, in your system, however you have it set up, maybe you can say that well, a wizard can access any one of these, or maybe a person can only master one of them in their lifetime, or maybe somebody can sort of collect them all, so to speak, catch them all, and they can sort of become a master of everything. Um, it really depends how your world works, and how long people can live in your world, and how long it takes to actually study and learn everything that each of the different sort of genres or subsets of your magic requires to learn. Sometimes there's a binary system, like in Star Wars, where you're either light side or you're dark side, but you can't be both because one of them prevents you from using magic from the other side. And the more of that one side that you use, the stronger you become in that side, and conversely, the weaker you would become in the other one. Dark side magic is not used to heal people. Light side magic can heal people. Um, we have dark side can shoot lightning. Light side can't actually directly hurt you. Um, it can push you around. It can push and pull, which is one of the sort of like more neutral uses of force powers. We have push, pull, um, grip and choke, which is actually usually kind of defined as a dark side power within the games and fiction and, and like, um, the, uh, the, like, diff in, in other, in media that is not just the movies, choking people with the force is usually seen as a dark side use of it, even though, strangely, this is one of those kind of flexible uses where we could say, aren't we just using the pinch power or the squeeze power? Isn't, is that really a dark side use of it? Or the fact, the moment it starts to hurt somebody, does it become a dark side power? You can ask those questions, and those can raise questions for your characters, too, and make them, especially in a book where we have access to the inside of their heads, they can be wondering, like, am I willing to go farther in this fight than I thought I was? Am I going to tap into that anger and that rage inside me? And maybe in a book, they could do that without anyone knowing, right? Like, if your character is transforming from a good Jedi into an evil Jedi, maybe in every fight scene, they tap into some painful memory of theirs, and they use it to make themselves just a little bit stronger, right? Essentially, they're microdosing on the dark side. Um, now, you could, why couldn't you do that in a movie, Amanda? Or how 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 would you? Why, why is that something that would only work in a book? Wait, so, so ask the question again. <laughs> okay, so your character is sliding from good to evil. 
because in remember in using the force the the yes. dark side comes from anger and pain so we have a good right, jedi right. that is in every fight they think of a really painful angry memory of theirs and they use that to make themselves just a little stronger than they would have been otherwise which is right, sort of right. their, their route to darkness right why can't we do that in a movie well we can't see in their mind yeah yeah it yeah. would just you'd have to like quick you'd have to flash to the thing that they were thinking of or right may, right right let, let's think of how we would do it in a movie maybe instead of because like flash cutaways and flashbacks and things like this are so jarring in a movie that maybe it'd be better just to like let's imagine your characters uh they had a child die or something like that so every time they want to tap into the dark side we just hear a child crying in the background that kind of represents mm -hmm. the fact that they're looking back and thinking about this thing and tapping into it but in a book it'd be much more subtle and it could be purely mental and you just it's almost impossible to do stuff that is purely mental in a movie or show and show the med and show the motivation and the and the hemming and hawing like in the book you could be like you could show the thought process of like i know i shouldn't do this but right. i've got to you know i've got to win and the debate and the yeah how does it make you feel about a character that is doing unsympathetic things if they keep justifying it in their mind or they every time they do something bad they're like well i have to or i don't want to do this how does that affect how you see that character differently like meaning like there it seems like a weakness or uh, what do you, you mean by you how does it affect see it that way for me it makes it a little easier to sympathize with them uh oh, what about you yes yeah i mean yeah that that's what i that's why i was saying it initially but then i thought your question was looking for something else <laughs> oh no no yeah so, yeah like so yeah tell us yeah about that. definitely more sympathy yeah can you yeah. name a character in a movie or show you've seen or a book that you've seen before where they are doing bad stuff but because we know why you kind of still feel sorry for them or are rooting for them um i don't know why hunger games is on my mind today um I don't know if she really does bad stuff. I mean, she has to kill people to survive, mm -hmm. um, but we kind of know that. Uh, well, that yeah, that's that's movie as well. We can um, see like some of the other people in the Hunger Games sort of take glee in it, though, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And we can see that she specifically doesn't. She like is struggling right. to survive and doesn't want to be doing this, which sort of I would say I would agree that helps us stay rooting for her more. Yeah, I mean, if, if yeah. We were, if it was the opposite and she's like, wait, I'm starting kind of starting to kind of like this. That'd be a much darker I, book and much different story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Harry Potter struggles a little bit, but he's so good to me. I know people talk about him being tempted, and I'm like, he was never. He was just good. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah. um, the books I think do allow us to get more into that than the movies, mm -hmm. though, because um, I think with just more page time and more intern interiority to the characters, we can sort of see that the. Slytherin people aren't necessarily e as evil as they sort of appear in the movies, be just because we can kind of like get deeper into why somebody would be a Slytherin and what what they actually offer and like what the benefits are and like yeah. I think that there's it's... more exposition in the yeah. book. Yeah, for, for sure. Michelle has mentioned Anakin Skywalker as well, which I think is another good example of a character that's doing bad stuff. True. Yeah. But we know why, um, and it makes perfect sense as to why, and it's the kind of reason that we can sort of see ourselves doing as well. I mean, if it was to save the person you love, a lot of people would do pretty bad stuff, or stuff that others would see as pretty bad. So, I forget exactly how I linked to this, but, oh yeah, so we're talking about just the mental things that your character can do in books that they just would not otherwise really be able to do in movies. So, um, I want to get, so we're still on, on limitations, I guess. Um, where did my slideshow go? Limitations. What can the magic never do? Okay, what can the Force not do? If we're sticking with the Star Wars example. Anyone? Can it not mind control? Can it mind control? I don't know. I, I only saw the first three, the old first three. It can mind trick, which is sort of a temporary mm -hmm. form of mind mind influence. Mm -hmm. It I don't mm -hmm. I don't believe you can permanently control someone with the force. Like in this, are you talking in the sense of like Theoden in Return of the or in um, uh, Two Towers, yeah. where he's sort of being Kinda haunted like by that. Saruman yeah. long term? I don't yeah. think it can do that, but on the short term, it definitely can. Okay. 
Michelle says the force can't raise the dead. And you are correct until a recent video game, which kind of did throw a wrench into that, uh, where now there's just basically zombies, but it can't return somebody to how they were before we could say. Um, so yeah, there's no, there until last year or until Jedi fallen order, there were no, uh, zombies in star Wars. Now there are. So we have to kind of, uh, you know, um, deal with that. But in any case, nor you're right. It cannot bring somebody back into a fully formed version of themselves again. Cinnamon says it cannot create objects. Yeah, uh, we're pretty sure it yeah. can't create new objects. Although in Last Jedi, we do see seemingly there's like a holographic ring that one of them carries. Or like what, uh, somebody like manifests a necklace using the Force, but it's an illusion or something. I think we can maybe fold that under the illusion category. But typically it can't create objects. Yeah. Can't make someone love you, says Michelle. Yeah, that's I think that's true. Because if we can't do long-term mind control, then yeah, there's no way to make someone permanently love you. You can make them say I love you with a mind trick but they wouldn't actually you couldn't make them actually mean it you could maybe make them kiss you but you couldn't do anything more than that i would guess Knight says can't teleport objects yeah that's right we can't usually teleport in star wars until of course jedi fallen order introduced the staff image which character that can teleport but whatever we're normally saying it can't do that how about time travel can it time travel no there's no time travel ever in star wars ever Teleportation was the other kind of big line to cross that recently has been crossed. So the rules are kind of always evolving in mediums that are being written by many different people in many different, you know, we have games, we have books, we have movies. So we can't rely on the rules being super consistent. But you guys have touched on some of the real stuff here, which is, yep, it cannot create objects. It cannot, like, manifest new objects. It can't bring people directly back from the dead. And it can't time travel. Those are sort of the three main things it can't do. I'll, I'll also say... It can't really access parallel universes because they're in Star I guess, but that's just really because in Star Wars there really aren't parallel universes unless we're counting legends or, or different canon chronologies. Um, but generally, there's no alternate worlds, parallel universes, or alternate dimensions in Star Wars too. Can you, can you, I mean, I know you can kind of, you can't really fly like freely, right? I mean, you can kind of do some like Matrix-like maneuvers, but yeah, you can't there's, really fly. As far fly. as I know, there's nobody that flies Superman style. Um, yeah they, in some of the games we can kind of glide around and like uh but the, i think game mechanics are usually not really canon exactly um they're not they're not like uh always going to carry over one to one to the fiction can you imagine if they had like a cover for the lightsaber and then they hopped on it like a broom <laughs> <laughs> a flying that lightsaber good. well that, they have that speeders would be a good least, spoof. <laughs> uh, yeah uh nacho did you have a question or comment go ahead yeah, we had some uh, comments from Magician Pianist on Twitch. Oh, great. Um, they said, oh, my God. Hi, I will stay. I write a huge fantasy fan fiction, and I love to hear about that. Um, light magic, in my case, it's counter magic. Can't attack, but don't shoot a fireball onto it. Time travel is, for me, a completely different kind of magic. Like, it's not connected to any kind of magic. It's just its own thing. Okay, great. Thank you for those comments. Um, yeah, I think sometimes we see light magic being used to counter or defend or protect or heal, um, as opposed to dark magic, which is going to be used to hurt, hinder, or to, um, you know, drain life, take away life from other people. Um, let's, uh, so we're, we're talking limitations still. So every, every magic system has some things that the magic just can't do. I think earlier... I saw a question in the chat, which is worth addressing. Michelle was asking, what if there are no rules and it's just the magic Wild West where magic rules don't apply? Magic beings just do whatever they want with each side just reacting. I would say in cases like that, you're talking sort of about gods or divine entities that are beyond the, the your character's understanding. Um, and in that case, we might believe that there are systems actually governing what they can do, just they may be incomprehensible or unknowable or forgotten to, to time or any of these things. Um, you can do that, and Lovecraftian systems kind of include um, some characters like that. It's like, what can Cthulhu actually do? I don't know. Everything? Anything? But he's asleep right now. So there is, are still some rules on those things. And in, in these cases where the magic is what we would call entirely wild or free magic, as it's sometimes known, then in, in like Sabriel, for instance, they call it free magic, um, then uh, these are usually going to be plot elements that are outside of your character's control. Whereas when we're writing action scenes, we're usually focusing on powers that are abilities that are within your character's control. So you can definitely have some unknowable magic. We don't understand how it works, but um, to, uh, that will be hard to use in action scenes, I guess I would say, unless it's like we're having a fight on a platform over a giant monster's head as it shoots lightning bolts at us. 
In which case, that might be an obstacle in a fight scene, but not something your characters are able to actively use. Okay, Cinnamon says, Time travel seems to cross into other genres, like sci-fi, more than most forms of magic. That's true sometimes, but there's plenty of fantasy stories with time travel as well. I mean, anybody play Ocarina of Time on the N64, which says, like, time travel is one of its main... Zelda has tons of time travel as one of its main mechanics. Um, or characters visiting other times in their life, like supernatural thrillers like The Butterfly Effect have time travel in a fantasy setting, too. So you're right that a, a lot of sci-fi sci does address this principle because some believe that it, in some day it might be possible, but usually fantasy is working with stuff that is not possible now and will never be, and um, it can be touched on in, do in different ways, which is what's really cool about the crossover between sci-fi and fantasy, and it's why it's neat when some works combine both, because you can look at some topics from either a sci-fi or fantasy point of view, case in point something like the matrix right which can, um, is going to compare this idea of like uh your written destiny with like your your uh, a codes or a program's purpose or we're going to be looking at things like we're almost finding the intersection of technology and like almost uh zen philosophy or zen theology um so yeah there's lots of interesting ways you can look at the same topics or ideas from both sci-fi and fantasy angles so let's um, start to think about cost. So what's the cost of using the Force? Let's stay on the Force for a while because I think we all know this one pretty well. And it also crosses mediums between games, books, and movies, and everything. So let's stay on the Force. What is the cost of using the Force? I didn't know there was. Is there a cost? You get tired? I didn't. I'm trying to think in the first three movies. Is there a cost? Uh, Except, yeah, there's, there's a couple. Well, I guess if you want to be more powerful, you have to go to the dark side, right? Or, or something? Or Pretty much. The dark side is more instantly gratifying and powerful, and you will like win more fights with it than you would with light okay. side powers. Yes, true. I mean, we could also say, though, I mean, the dark side can't like make someone's uh, disease go away. So at the same time, we if we're looking at strictly just fighting ability, then yeah, dark side's more powerful. And you're right, it does make you tired, seemingly, as you use it. I think in The Last Jedi, if anybody saw this, we saw that it can, in fact, kill you if you use it too much or too powerful of an effect. So it's not just making you tired. It, like, actually does drain from you. Anyone else? Kev says corruption to the dark side. Yes, that's a big one. Somebody explain the corruption thing. How does the corruption work? And this is not just in Star Wars. We see corruption in all kinds of magic. Any volunteers? Amanda, you've seen Star Wars, right? You're on the stage already. Can you repeat the question again? Sorry. How does the dark side corruption work? Oh, how does it work? Um, well, you you have to access angry or like dark emotions mm -hmm. to to so you basically become like corrupted with hatred and with dark feelings. That's my understanding of it. I've only seen those three again. I keep saying that um, That's okay. you're where it didn't you're go right. into the. It didn't build out the system as much in those, but... Not too much, but you, you're right. So I think we understand that it you access negative or angry emotions to use it. It makes you more powerful. And the more you use it, I think the, the corruption part is what I was getting at here. Okay. So the more you use it, how does it affect the person that's using it? it? You become more evil when you use it that way. Yeah, so the more it builds on itself, yeah. it snowballs. So the more yeah. evil powers you use, the more evil you become. And also you physically change uh, sometimes too, whether that is the result mm -hmm. of um, you know, your veins might start turning black or you might start to like, what is, what does, uh, Sidious look like? Right. Um, or mm -hmm. think of all these different sort of force creatures and users that we see that are actually corrupted or they are, um, twisted by the, the powers inside them. Like the, the, it's like reshaping them or reforming them. It can mutate you a little bit. So those are all costs. I think we see some other costs in here. Cinnamon says you don't have the freedom to live a more indulgent life. Yeah, we could look at that as... So in order to be a Jedi and to use the Force tradition or to access the teachings of the Force tradition that, or of the main sort of Force tradition, which is the Jedi, then you have to become one of them. They don't just share them with outsiders and to become one of them, you have to give certain things up in your life. 
things like Michelle mentioned personal relationships. Yeah, which is actually a better way of defining it. Some people think that um, Jedi can't have sex. The thing is they actually can. They can't form close bonds, though. So that's that challenge. That's like that interesting kind of middle ground between those things where it's like, oh, they just can't. The closer they become to other people, the sort of worse of a Jedi that you are because you aren't sort of one with the Force. Um, so, yeah, you have to give a lot up in order to learn these things. Or, And if you want to learn them in some kind of other tradition, you're going to have to do some shady stuff to get it. Um, so that's a big cost, that, that sort of moral cost, the social cost. Um, you have to, like, become a completely different person if you want to pursue these teachings. It's not something you can typically really learn to do on your own. There are some examples of characters learning to use it on their own, but in, for the most part, you have to have a teacher. You have to become, you have to do what other people tell you. You have to follow the rules. You have to train for years and get their, I don't know, get their coffees and stuff like that as they train you how to, you know, reflect lasers back at little droids. So there's, all, yeah, there's all kinds of costs beyond just, yes, it makes you tired. Yes, if you use too much at once, it can kill you. But beyond that, there's plenty of other problems that can arise as a result of using the force. Um, and I think that uh, this, this is just going to lead to some of the most interesting moments, both in fight scenes and just the larger, the, you know, the stories in general. Um, it's going to lead to interesting problems, and your character is going to have additional objectives as, as they attempt to solve those problems. So um, we can also think of interesting ways that we can overcome those limitations, you know, in the hands of a creative user. Then sort of the... Um, it's they're some of the most fun scenes to watch because we're watching characters manipulate the powers and using rules that we already understand and limitations that we already understand and if, if we watch them sort of combine those in ways that we hadn't thought of then it just is incredibly satisfying to watch um so just some suggestions there for ways to be thinking about the system itself before you get too in the weeds on the fighting so think of what are its limitations what can it not do what components does it require? So does, does it require gathering of difficult to find materials that will be consumed? Does it require your character to be touching something, reading something, thinking something? And again, is it consumed or does it stick around after? Or how many times can they use it? What is the cost of using it? Does it exhaust them? Does it make them bleed? Um, does it make them uh, uh, evil? Does it make them, in order to get it, do they have to give something up? Do they have to work extra hard? Do they have to complete a certain trial or task before they can get access to it? So, and, and last, always be thinking of problems that your characters can solve in interesting ways. So if it's something like, you know, your, your character is in the middle of a fight, um, they're losing, and they, they're a light side Jedi, they may realize that in order to win this fight, they have to tap into the dark side a little bit. That might be an interesting character moment. Um, and watching the character solve this problem of how am I going to win this fight with I'm going to become a little bit more evil, but of course I'll be able to control it. Of course I'm going to be able to you know, put a stop to it. And I, I'm not going to, I'm not an evil person. I'm just doing this for one time. Like we can watch that really interesting dynamic as your character solves the problem in a, in a way that forces them to be pushed to the edge of their competence and to try combining stuff in different ways. Okay, here's an explanation from Magician Pianist off Twitch. The dark side corruption, mental breakdown can cause that too, like losing a loved one or cur being cursed to become evil. Yeah, exactly. So it, I think that terrible, tragic things happening to people can sometimes push them towards the dark side. And the more that you engage in those feelings, the more that they overcome you until it has a kind of addictive element to it. A lot of the time, the cost element of evil magic will be that it's addictive in a way, possibly because it's chemically or physically addictive and possibly because it just is such easy, quick gratification that your character just gets used to using it and doesn't see the downsides until it's too late. Okay, um, so I think I'm going to skip these slides here. I'm going to go to set pieces because this is an important part of uh, writing fantasy action scenes. So a set piece is a scene or sequence which, with escalated stakes and in terms of movies or TV, escalated production value as appropriate to the genre compared to the rest of that work. So that means that it's going to be a distinct beginning, middle, and end sequence. Usually we're talking, and if we're talking action set pieces, that's going to be an arena that your characters are fighting in. An opponent is going to be included in the set piece too, and a method by which your character will take on that opponent. Also included in that sort of set piece checklist is going to be things like a ticking clock, other inhibiting factors or hazards around that arena. So be putting on your game design hat a little bit here, and you can be thinking like in terms of a video game, what would make this an interesting dynamic place for the characters to be fighting? Okay, we have a flat arena space. To me, what would we put in an arena to make it a more interesting fight? Um, I actually have some answers, but I'm going to maybe throw it to the room. How can we start to make an arena, like a coliseum, a more interesting and dynamic place using the things I just mentioned? Hazards, 
ticking clocks, and complications. Someone can raise a hand, or you can use the text chats. Uh, looks like we have a raised hand. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, I've invited Michelle to the stage, so feel free to accept that and you can speak. Uh, looks like we have, is the name just T? T says you could have obstacles in the arena, such as water, lava, or fire, or plants. Okay, great. Yep, those are good ideas. Fire, plants, water, lava, things that your characters can't touch or else they'll be hurt. Water is an interesting one because water isn't necessarily deadly, but can be used in deadly ways. What are some other things we can use to spice up a fight in a Colosseum-style arena? Michelle says fire from pits that's unpredictable. Okay, so you're talking about almost like battle bots style hazards, like flames that burst out at unpredictable times. Sure, we can have um, unpredictable traps or hazards that, uh, or in, in combination with some that are more routine. You know, you have some spikes that slide out every second. You have some spikes that come out at random times. Hidden weapons or hidden passages, says T. Yeah, great idea. So we could have some weapons hidden in the arena themselves. You know, maybe it's littered with the corpses of the prior gladiators and you can take whatever you can find. Or it could be that there's hidden passages. Yeah, if you f step on just the right spot, maybe you slide down a chute which has extra weapons. Or maybe you, you can even find a secret escape route if you know exactly where to look. Looks like we have another comment on Twitch um, from Magician Pianist. Is this in reference to this question? He says, in my case, it's about some sort of magic catalyst. In the end, you can see the weapons as catalysts and stronger magics. It has to be two who use the exact magic at the time. Do that alone and you lose something. Okay, I think this is not in reference to this question. Looks like Michelle has accepted the speaking invitation. Go ahead, Michelle. Sorry, I had to reset um, the orientation and turn it. Um, okay, so yeah, I mean, I was just, you know, so any any unpredictable element, um, I think, is um, really good. I just, to me... Um, fire is really dangerous um so you know maybe like whatever you're wearing could catch on fire so that's why you know um i think it's it's pretty bad um but um um but it, it to me it needs to be unpredictable so you can't time it you know you can't you know so like especially if you're good at rhythm you can't you can't just like time the thing and be able to get through it you know um it needs to be unpredictable like if you were in some kind of like enclosed labyrinth and you get to a part where there's like, you know, swinging pendulums that will cut you in half, you know, kind of thinking like kind of like um, Indiana Jones, um, but he's able to time it, you know, and get through. But but if these are unpredictable in their timing, then you've just got to be lucky, you know, right. and especially if there's things like, oh, in addition to that, there's fire that shoots up you know, um, that, you know, can catch you on fire, that, that would be, that, that, that whole obstacle would be really, really difficult to overcome. I'm not saying that the hero couldn't, but it'd be like, I think it'd just be luck and nothing else. So what are some unpredictable elements that we can introduce to an arena fight that are not just traps? Um, monsters that come up, you know, Great. or jump down, mm -hmm. you know, um, really dangerous monsters like that shoot acid or, you know, that are difficult to defeat, you know, um, maybe, maybe if they, maybe if they 
claw you or bite you. Um, there's now poison in your system and you've only got like a short time to be able to, you know, to defeat them, get the antidote and live. Sure. Sure. That'd be great. Especially if the antidote is somewhere in the arena. So we can sort of visually see your character making progress towards getting it. Or then it gets kicked across the floor. You know, then this happens in the second Indiana Jones movie where Indy's poisoned. Mm-hmm. And then the antidote is sort of being kicked around a party that he has to fight his way through in order to get. So, yeah, that would make an interesting element. Animals, creatures, team says classic gladiator fighting a lion. Yeah, I think if anyone's seen Gladiator, they unleash a, a tiger into the arena, which is a very unpredictable mm-hmm. element that nobody can really uh, um, time. Or I mean, you if you have a character th- that has experience with animals maybe suddenly that would be a great time for them to shine too um you know the Mm -hmm. enemy unleashes a tiger on them your main character tames it and now he's got a tiger on his side that sort of is a way of your character turning a disadvantage into an advantage which is always fun to see in fight scenes maybe a little bit of comedy um introduced then where they they treat the tiger the lion um like a house cat and they find the place where if you scratch its jaws you know its jowls it'll go her and you know and turn over you know sure. but after they maybe after they run around trying to avoid the tiger or lion or whatever and they they're able to do that i think of like how to train your dragon one of my most favorite movies um but that would be kind of a, a, a funny comic element i'm i'm personally i think com- a little bit of comedy should be introduced into everything just i i think it's nice anyway sure sure yeah that can definitely work what are some ticking clocks that we can add? So we mentioned the poison one. That's a good, always a good ticking clock for a fight scene, poison. Um, what are some other ticking clocks we can add to spice up an arena fight scene? We've got tigers. We've got traps. What else? Maybe maybe um, spikes in the floor that that come up or maybe the walls and begin, you know, with, they have spikes now, like in the second Indiana Jones, or maybe like in the first star Wars where the walls are now closing in and it's getting more dangerous. And, you know, so in addition to the poison and the animals and the, you know, the weapons now, now there's a set of walls that are coming in and, um, you know, or maybe poison, if it's enclosed, maybe poison gas has been released and, you know, um, it doesn't kill you immediately. You've got like 15 minutes before you die. Sure, we could do this. So a tra- like an execution trap that's meant to finish off everybody if you don't finish your fight in time. We could do that. Yep. Where the walls are closing or there's something being vented in or it's being flooded. Something like that. Okay. So, um, T says a damsel in distress being lowered into lava that the main character has to save. Sure, that's a great ticking clock. We have somebody that we're trying to protect or save in a limited time till they are done. Um, anything else? What are some other ticking clocks that we can use or things that can increase the intensity or escalate throughout the fight to make it more dynamic and interesting? We've done all the things I would do. I mean, I, I like the damsel in distress, or maybe it's that... Maybe it's that person, that person's wife, or or spe- or same sex spouse, or kid, you know. Okay. Yep. Having a person to save definitely a good objective. Mm-hmm. What about the crowd? Anything we could do with the crowd? Oh, maybe, m- maybe. Um... Oh, when when um, I just read last as well, I was watching last night. There was this one emperor who came to the throne of Rome, really, uh, really young, and um, one of the things he liked to do was to release poisonous snakes into the audience. So maybe there's poisonous, you know, uh, animals of some kind being released into the um, into the crowd, and people are being bitten, you know, and um, and dying very quickly. Okay, would that help or hurt the heroes that are actually in the arena? Well, okay, if the hero if the hero can defeat all these obstacles, then the the person in charge, whatever that might be, you know, will will not release the um uh, all of the poisonous animals, but a few have been released and um the the hero has to overcome all these obstacles to prevent the the person in charge from killing all of the audience and in, in addition okay yeah it's kind of a complicated situation but i can sort of see how that would be a ticking clock 
I was thinking just really simply here, how about like the crowd is getting bored and throughout the fight, they start throwing in weapons like we see in WWE matches or something like that, right? Or what about the crowd is getting more and more rowdy as the fight goes on and as they lose their favorite gladiators. So the crowd members are going to start jumping into the arena and joining in the fight. I'm just thinking of pretty much any ticking clock, any anything that can be used to increase and add pressure on the characters as the fight goes on, using the things that we have access to in this space. There's lots of options. Let's see. We have a, another comment from Magician Pianist off Twitch. He says, how to make it more interesting by using things against both the protagonist and the enemy. Uh, you have a protagonist who uses plant magic and an enemy using wind or quantum. The plant magic user has a problem because the arena and the enemy keeps moving. The person is a bow user, but the enemy is blind or deaf and can't see or hear what's going on. So, okay, yeah, maybe having different effects in the fight that inhibit both of them or affect both of the different both of the combatants. Someone fights for a person who's about to die, or really funny one. A guy fights for the love of his life. The love is about to give birth. Okay, yeah, giving somebody is giving birth can be a very strong ticking clock. And he defeats the enemy in time or his love can die from the birth. Sure. Yeah, I think we, we saw that as a ticking clock in the Quiet Place movie recently where the woman is going into labor as there's monsters stalking around the house that can hear sound really well. So she has to not make a single sound. And then, you know, the closer she gets to giving birth, the more danger we are in. Great ticking clock. All right. Thank you for the comments, guys. I'm going to uh, move to a set piece checklist, which should just give you some ideas of things that you might want to include. So ask yourself first, just what is the unique and cool environment and atmosphere? So first of all, where are we? And what does it feel like? Is it creepy here? Is it really, um, is it like a joyous celebration? Is everybody out of their mind on drugs and they're barely paying attention to what's going on, like a nightclub or a, a music festival? Just think of like, what is the atmosphere like? What is the emotion that you're trying to create just by the basic setup of things going on here? Um, sometimes this can reframe the fight in totally different contexts too. I always think of this really good scene from uh, the Road to Perdition, which is the um, gangster movie with Tom Hanks. Um, there's a shootout scene in the basement or the undercroft of a cathedral while there's a choir practicing upstairs. And it just lends this, uh, it makes the song kind of echo throughout the concrete of the space. And just we hear gunshots punctuated or gun gunshots are punctuating these hymns and psalms that are being performed up above. And it just adds this air of sanctitude and um like uh religiosity to the to the fight itself it makes it feel almost profane and sinful what's going on there so be thinking of how that atmosphere can actually matter in a story sense as well as just it being cool or looking cool how, how can it matter otherwise how can it matter thematically or emotionally to your character you know a fight to the death in the house where you grew up is going to be a little different as than a, a fight to the death in the middle of a museum right because in the, the house where your character grew up they're going to get thrown through a shelf that had all their favorite childhood trophies on it they're going to get, you know, slammed into a wall and they're going to break the childhood picture of their dog that they miss very much. Like, we're going to have the ability in prose to very quickly show us how those things matter to the character or especially if we're in your character's POV, sort of be experiencing those things, triggering memories and sensory experiences alongside that person. So uh, be thinking how you can use the space that you are in for emotional, tangible kind of like combat effects. And also think of the different limitations and ticking clocks that could arise from the space itself. Like, you know, we're in a library, we have to have a fight, we have to be very quiet in the library. It's a very sort of Jackie Chan movie kind of approach. We need to be thinking, what is the goalpost? And the goalpost is not always just going to be to kill the other person. Often there will be something we're trying to get, someone we're trying to protect. You should try to maybe mix up your different set pieces and objectives and um, between uh, the main kind of uh, umbrella is going to include attack, defend, and move. So we're trying to either destroy something, protect something or go from one, one place to another place or take some, you know, escort might be under a kind of move umbrella too. So we want to have fights or, or action sequences in your book that are using all of three. And sometimes in the same fight, we have multiple different objectives in the same fight, or sometimes something interrupts us halfway through and we're forced to recalibrate and to start entirely over and try something else. Or sometimes we'll have one objective all the way through to the end. But regardless of that, we'd like to see your characters just being forced to be competent in different ways. And also we like to see characters with different strengths being forced to um, find, being forced to solve problems in areas that are not their top skill, right? Which is sort of the basis of Superman style storytelling, right? Because is Superman ever going to really lose a fight with a monster or an alien? The answer is no, unless it has kryptonite. But generally the question isn't, can he defeat the alien? The question is going to be, what? What's another objective that Superman could have at the same time as the alien, which would push him to the edge of his competence in an arena that is not the one that he's normally strongest at. I'm 
man, it says time limit. Okay, so what kind of time limit? Carmen says, there are people in the desert pretending to be cops. Is this an answer to my question, or is this a something you're worried about or what i don't i don't that's a non sequitur to me i can't quite figure out what you mean there okay not seeing any answers to this question i'm just gonna maybe throw you guys a freebie how about he has to save lois lane that's a pretty common one right i mean so while he's fighting the alien lois lane is hanging from the side of a bridge and he has to then sort of choose do i let this monster destroy the city or do i save the woman i love Carmen says just precautionary. Okay, I'm not, I still am not quite sure why you're talking about people, fake cops in the desert. Is this a log line or is this a, something we should know about? Okay, um, looks like we have a question or comment from Michelle. Go ahead. Okay, so in the first, in the first one, he solves both of them by reversing the, um, reversing the, the spin of the earth. So he turns it back in time, you know, and he's able to solve it to, rescue Lois Lane and, you know, and prevent the, the, um, the, um, dynam or the, the, the atom, well, nuclear bombs from exploding and causing, um, uh, most of California to, to fall into the sea through earthquakes. Um, so, you know, that was the, on the first one, the second one, uh, all the other ones, um, I'm drawing a blank, but yeah, I mean, he, it's Superman, so he's not going to let Lois Lane die um, or let the city go to ruin by the monster or whatever is attacking. He's going to find a way to say to do both because, well, he's Superman. But, you know, the one where Superman dies, you know, and they bring him back to life, um, um, you know, I, I don't, I think Lois Lane is saved, but he ends up dying. I don't. I'll have to rewatch it sometime. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure which movie you're referring to. I, I guess I was just sort of asking the question. Superman, Go ahead. Superman versus Batman, and 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 Wonder Woman has it convinces Batman that they have to raise him back from the dead. I don't know how they're going to do that. I forgot um, because he's Superman. He's a he's a even though he may be a Kryptonian on Earth, he's essentially a god, but mm -hmm. he dies yet, you know. Right, so the question was, if your character is competent in one way, and we're challenging, we're saying he is fighting an alien and he's very good at fighting, what is something uh -huh. else that he could be doing in the same sequence that is going to force him to, or some other ticking clock or challenge that he might have to face? So um, the first example we used was he have to, has to save Lois Lane. Let's maybe, don't think of the movies necessarily, just think in general. What is something else that your character might have to do besides just save someone in order to challenge them in a way different than how they are normally competent? Well, they could have to save, you know, their loved one. Doesn't have to be a Lois Lane, but it could be have to save their loved one, their mom, their dad, their boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, um, a child. Um, okay. Um, uh, and endangered species, maybe, maybe the last couple of um, you know, of whatever, maybe pandas on Earth. You know, so but okay. but besides having to save someone, what is another way that we could challenge a character that is strong at fighting in such a way that we can make an action scene more dynamic? So, in cinnamon in the chat has just given us they might have to overcome psychological trauma. There you go. That might be something like we have Batman oh. has to do this all the time, right? Batman is very good at fighting and gadgets, and he's very rich, but he struggles with this concept of his own trauma and his this loss that has tr sort of made him into who he is today. Um, in such a way that, you know, we can put him in a fight and he'll almost always win. But the more that you start to challenge him in that other way, the more interesting the fight becomes, right? If the villains are taking advantage of his previous trauma and trying to use that to hurt him even more, you know, they're dressing up like the guy that shot his parents or whatever, then that can make that challenge much more interesting for a character that otherwise would not have been very challenged by a fight. What if there's a, a kind of, quote, kryptonite, not necessarily Superman, but what if there's a thing that can defeat um the the superhero or the fight you know whoever the hero is what if there's a thing that can defeat the hero sorry what's the question 
Well, okay. I'm thinking of Superman specifically, you know, green kryptonite can make him weak and, you know, makes him, makes him, you know, only as strong as, you know, as any human. It doesn't make, gives them these, what are essentially supernatural fighting skills and, you know, and, and strength. Um, but what if he, um, what, what if the hero or heroine now, um, is now encounters a thing that, you know, um, makes them not as uh, as able to fight like i mean i don't know i mean whatever the hero is like an achilles heel is is essentially it you know sure. some some achilles heel which is what the kryptonite is is a, is an achilles heel yeah. um you can have a character this... that has a weakness and this might play into the set piece somehow for instance i mean if we have it, your character is terrified of water and we're fighting on a boat, then of course they're going to be extra nervous if they almost get thrown overboard, right? Or they're going to be, mm -hmm. um, if they get thrown overboard, it might uh, make them panic or it might um, cause them to leave. They might run away. They might, um, you know, it, it's going to add that extra element of danger. So sure, that, that might be a nice way to spice up a set piece by adding some kind of special weakness that your character is being threatened by. Or like in the last Star Wars movie where, where, um, um, Luke Skywalker has just given up, and it's not until you know he's he he realizes that he's got to go and defeat the 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 First Order, and it's his last act, and he uses all of his Jedi powers to defeat Kylo Ren, and you know he he has this this one last act that he's like. You know, he overcomes the first, he overcomes him and all of his, you know, um, dark, dark force energy. And, you know, and then, like I said, that's the last thing he does. And then he becomes a force ghost. Um, well, he's his what he's been um, um, what's been keeping him from fighting is his own is his own emotional issues, you know, where he's just given up, you know, on the on the force and everything. And even though he's been training Bren, um he just he just gives up and that's his that's his achilles heel yeah for sure his failure his uh his feel feeling like he didn't do that he didn't rebuild the jedi order like he wanted thank you for the comments mm -hmm. michelle i think we have a comment from sure. uh dan go ahead dan i was gonna re recommend uh, i don't know if anyone had brought it up but a character who's good at winning a fight but that's not their problem I can think of the, I know it's, I don't know if it counts because it's anime, but One Punch Man literally wins every fight in one punch, but he's miserable because he can't get a good fight, a good honorable fight, because he wins them too well. Interesting. Okay, so the fact that he always wins is actually a problem. Yes. Okay, and why is that such a problem for him? Is it like a world where the winning I is less important? I haven't really than... watched too much of it, but I know other people have told me about it. Okay. Maybe we can just imagine in what the answer might be, though. So we might say in that case that maybe winning the fight isn't what's important because it's a world that's based on or that where power comes from showmanship or comes from how, how many people you can entertain or something like that, right? I mean, if it's like a football team that always wins after their first kick, then people might not pay as much to see them because it's like we're paying to watch the fight. That could be an interesting take. What would another reason be why the character winning the fight would, every time would be a problem? As uh, Michelle just said, empty victory. Oh, okay. So There's he's just no not honor. There's no thrill. Okay. Yeah. If and if that was a big reason why he started doing this in the first place, if it was always just for the thrill, then yeah, that might be a big limitation to him, or it might be a, cause a big problem for him. If suddenly this isn't offering the same emotional experience anymore, definitely. Thank you for the comments, Dan. Unless, did you have anything else? No. Okay. Thanks a lot. I think we have one more. We'll bring on Carmen. Who has a hand raised? Go ahead, Carmen. Then we're going to go into our reading from Enchantment of Ravens. Carmen, are you able to accept the invitation to speak on the stage? Maybe not. That's okay. Okay. Well, feel free to join us if you're able to. Um, 
I just had something queued up. Okay, so I'm going to um, paste this into drives just so we can all read it. I'm going to read a fight scene from uh, this book. Um, let me find the my spot. I was just just had it. Okay, I'm gonna copy and paste this text. Give me one moment. So um, I am going to read this out loud. I'll go pretty quickly. I'll try to make sure to. I mean, I'm not the not not an audiobook narrator, but I will do my best to read it qu clearly and within. I think it'll take probably five to ten minutes. Um, and let's try to think of all the things that we've gone over so far. So in terms of the set piece checklist, we're asking where is this taking place? What is the environment and atmosphere? How does the set piece allow us to learn more about the world? How can we kind of mine a little bit of fun out of the premise? We might ask, what is the goalpost? What specific stunts or tricks are we able to use? What is the pace of the scene? And also be paying a special attention to the ways that we are in the main character's head and able to filter what's happening through her experience in such a way that we can just get more, learn more about her character and about the, we can do some, you know, world building and also just kind of dive into the character's emotions, thoughts, and feelings as the fight goes on much more than we'd be able to do in other mediums. Uh, okay, I think I know how to do this. Yeah, I know where to start. Okay. All right, so I'm going to just give you guys the uh, quick explanation of what the book is, and then we'll go right into the reading. So um, the premise for this book is this is about this is a YA fantasy book from I think 2017 or 2018. It's about a painter in a world that is populated by both humans and the fair folk, which are otherwise known as I guess they're essentially uh, imagine elves like Lord of the Rings style elves. These immortal creatures that they're obsessed with art, but they can't create it on their own. So um, when a the the prince of the autumn court he heads to the human world and he gets our main character, the painter named Isabel. To do a portrait of him, she ends up painting him looking very sad, painting mortal sorrow into his features, which it turns out is a big offense to the elves. So he essentially kidnaps her, takes her to stand trial for her crimes in the fairy kingdom. And as he is taking her there, they encounter various challenges and monsters that they have to deal with. So that's where we are. Um, so our characters are Rook, he's the elf prince, and we have Isabel, who's the human painter. And as they're going through the woods, they encounter something called a Barrow Lord. So I'm going to read through, and um, uh, I will have time. We'll have time for questions afterwards. All right, um, I'm going to start at this part where she's asking, "What is the Barrow Lord?" And this is a Barrow Lord, by the way, is like a mound of earth. It's like a living grave, basically. It's like a um, uh, a, a big lump of, of ground and earth that uh, it can stand up and turn into a giant monster that's essentially comprised of the corpses inside it, the graves that are sticking out of it, and the roots and all the natural vegetation that it's made of. So this is going to be a fight scene between the elf, the human, and the monster. Let's read. Okay. You guys can see it on here, right? Yeah. She, Isabel starts by asking, What is a barrel lord, a barrel lord exactly? I asked. In this matter, you might prefer ignorance. Believe me, I never do. If you insist, he said, reluctant, most fairy beasts rise with a single mortal's bones lending them life. I nodded. I had known as much already. Barrow lords are aberrations, each one a mass of remains entangled with one another in death. They are tormented creatures, enraged, at odds with themselves. We do not nurture their growth. They quicken on their own, in places where the mortals of ages past buried victims of war or plague. Oh, sorry, where the mortals of ages past buried victims of war or plague. 
As if hearing itself spoken aloud, the mound quivered. Soil shifted and tumbled to the ground. A grotesque sound emanated from within, the damp sucking of something moist coming apart deep below the earth. Whatever this thing was, it was bigger than a thane, bigger than all the hounds combined. She's referring here to earlier monsters that they've encountered. Rook unsheathed his sword and strode toward the mound, projecting a casual ease and confidence that struck me as, as being as fake as his glamour. Whether he was wearing it for my benefit or his own, I couldn't guess. As soon as he reached the, stout, the stone circle's outer edge, the mound heaved in earnest. It bulged in first, first in one place and then another, like a larva attempting to split its cocoon. Carrion beetles poured from the earth in rivulets, along with some sort of dribbling fluid. The stench of wet decay struck me like a punch to the gut. Helplessly, I doubled over and retched. One last straining swell and the mound disgorged its contents. A lopsided form burst forth, slumping over Rook at twice his height, lumps of dirt, ca dirt cascading off its sides. No illusion softened this monstrosity. It had the correct number of appendages in more or less the expected places, but that was all I could say in its favor. Its flesh was the skin of a decomposing log, riddled with disease and fungus. Its head a hollow bark cave with two empty sockets from which a pair of mushroom clusters grew, wiggling on about on long stalks with a life of their own. Right away, the twisted stalks simultaneous the stalks twisted simultaneously, pointing the mushroom's caps down at Rook. Eyes. Those were its eyes. Pressure built at the back of my skull. In the distance, or behind a closed door, voices argued. So Isabel is now hearing the kind of psychic emanations of this creature. A little girl sobbed. Impatiently, someone scolded her. A man bellowed in wordless agony. The Barrow Lord gave a compulsive ripple, almost overbalancing itself. Its frame was bear-like, but its front legs, its arms, I found myself thinking, were overlong, and it struggled to maintain its drooping upright stance. I was trying to make it was trying to make itself human again, I realized, in the only way it could. Rook's sword flashed, opening a slice along the beast's underbelly. Its putrid skin split without effort. He stepped back just in time to avoid the slippery cascade of fungus that spilled from the wound, halting one neat inch from the tips of his boots. The voices stopped. Then they all screamed in unison. So notice how much we're able to do in her head, including psychic stuff, like telepathy kind of stuff, which can be really good in a fight. Sort of allow you to get more information than a character would normally be able to gain or glean in a split, sec split second. So the Barrow Lord's arm lashed out, scoring the statue in front of which Rook, in front of which Rook had stood a split second earlier, spraying chips of stone and moss. It slashed at him again and again, senseless and unpredictable in its maddened violence, forcing him to retreat beyond its reach. His back touched the hedge and began circling it. His e his steps easy, a cat circling a hound, unafraid. It's another great thing we can do in fight scenes in books. We can use symbolism, imagery similes and metaphors within the text that we just would not have access to in the same way. It shambled after him, lunging clumsily over the standing stones. Rook was trying to draw it away from me, but as soon as I had that thought, the little girl's voice called out, strident, and the Barrow Lord paused. In a sudden wet contraction, the mushrooms rolled backward to look at me instead. I stumbled back blindly. I heard the groan and crash of trees toppling, my gaze fixed only on the hor horror hurtling in my direction. It was so rotten, pieces of its body peeled away as it ran, dislodged by the concussive force of its stride. Rook appeared between us. His sword flashed once, twice. The arm of the Barrow Lord had raised to cut me down, exploded porously on the forest floor. Beetles swarmed in the cavity left behind. Missing a limb, its unbalanced weight dragged it backwards, and it collapsed against a pair of the carven stones, skin rupturing, pushing the monuments aslant. For a moment, I thought Rook had won. The fall had left the beast in ruins. Mucus glistened, seeped from the wreckage of its hide, but already it struggled back upright, wet fungus-slimed roots slopping from its stump to form a new arm. Its head weaved from side to side, dripping. The voices consulted one another in an agitated murmur. Rook adjusted his grip on his sword as he stalked back into the fray, crushing debris beneath his heels. Out flashed the blade, chunks of wood flew. He could go on like this for days, chipping away at the monster without rest. If it hadn't been for the need to keep me alive, I suspected the Barrow Lord wouldn't have posed much of a threat to him at all. Something grabbed my ankle. I looked down. A human skeleton, held together with vegetable sinew, had clawed free from the Barrow Lord's severed limb. Shuddering nightmarishly, it flung its other hand to seize my skirt and its bony fingers. Tumorous mushrooms bulged between its ribs, forced its jaw ajar. It clutched at me, dragging itself higher, gripped by hard -worn, gripped by hard-worn grip. Closer than all the other voices, a woman sobbed and pleaded. I can't help you, I whispered, turned inside out and shaken empty by horror. I can't. 
Rook was there. He seized the corpse by its skull and wrenched it off me, crushing the brown, aged, brittled bones like an eggshell. Then he looked over his shoulder. Without hesitation, he seized me by the shoulders and pushed me aside. I landed in the bushes, the breath dashed from my lungs, just in time to see the Barrel Lord swat him. Rook slammed against a tree several yards away and slumped to the ground, his sword skittering across the clearing. Oh god. The Barrel Lord only had eyes for me now. It lumbered forward until I lay in the fetid darkness of its shadow. Ravens launched themselves shrieking from the trees to claw and peck at its back, flap wings in its face, but their calls soon turned to shrill squawks of desperation as their feathers stuck to the Barrel Lord's hide. Skeletal hands surfaced, clutching at them greedily and pulling them inside. The birds struggled and thrashed, but soon all that remained was a beak here, a wing there, protruding at random from the monster's rancid flesh. Some of them kept twitching. The Barrel Lord lowered its head to my level. Its head alone was the size of a log, the round, mouth-hollow, broad enough for a person to crawl into. The mushrooms twisted and turned, a hot gust blew out, and then another. Surely I was too small, too weak to pose the creature any danger. The voices whispered amongst themselves. The little girl giggled. A ragged wail tore from my chest, and I sank my fingers into its spongy face. This gave me enough purchase to haul myself up and seize one of its eye clusters with my other hand, the one wearing my iron ring. Instantly, the mushrooms wilted. They turned gray and brittle, shriveling in my grasp. All the voices groaned in unison from that faraway room I'd begun to think of as hell, and the Barrel Lord took a step back, dragging my legs across the ground. I gave the eye stalks one last squeeze, feeling them crumble away. I only needed to buy myself another second, because out of the corner of my eye, I saw Rook getting up. He had one hand inside his coat, holding his chest, and the look on his face was terrifying to behold, contorted with pain and fury. His steps weaved. I wondered if he'd make it. He did. I let go and tumbled to the ground as he staggered up to the Barrel Lord's face, pulled the bloody hand from his coat, and thrust it into the monster's mouth. From there came a cracking sound, wood splintering and snapping. The Barrel Lord's body convulsed and canted stiffly to one side. Then thorny branches, as thick around as my torso, burst from every inch of its flesh, skewering it a hundred times over, pinning it in place like a grisly statue. I wasn't sure if it was dead. I'm not even sure it even mattered. One last branch pushed slowly out of its remaining eye, and yellow leaves unfolded inches from my nose. Rook, I breathed. You did it. But a thump interrupted me. I pushed the leaves aside to find Rook collapsed, unconscious, with his glamour bleeding away. All right. Uh, it was like three, four pages. Kind of a long out loud read. But um, thanks for listening, guys. This was, I think, end of chapter six in Enchantment of Ravens by Margaret Rogerson. So lots of internal stuff happening here, right? A lot of reaching into our character's experience and a lot of sensory details. The stench of wet decay strikes her like a punch to the gut. Helplessly, she doubles over and retches. Are you seeing maybe some ways that we can use this sort of sensory experience to make us feel like not just we're watching something happen to the character, but that we kind of are the character? Questions and comments on the scene. Michelle says, I could definitely use this in my writing. Great. Yep, always good to look at published work for examples of things that we can draw from and tools that we can use, even if we don't use them in the exact same way. What are some other things you guys notice in this scene? Anything we talked about today? Michelle says, very sensory. Yep. Lots of smells and tastes, memories. What is the sort of emotional journey of the scene? Maybe I'll ask that question. So... Where do we start and where do we end up? Uh, 
uh, okay, no questions, no comments. I guess maybe we'll just end the class here. Uh, do you guys, is anyone, are you guys, are we doing this? <laughs> I think we should um, wrap up, um, maybe let you guys know of the things that we have coming up. So we have a class tomorrow uh, from 10 to noon on magic creatures, kind of like this one, this magic creature that we saw here, and um, designing them for your own work. And then later today, we also have lab from four to six for our subscribers, so come on by if you'd like to bring up to five pages of anything that you're working on or ask any questions, comments, or topics that you'd like to hear more about in writing, screenplays, TV, or novels. Here's a comment from Cinnamon. Thank you, Cinnamon. One thing I noticed in reading this is that the main character doesn't seem that active. She doesn't seem like a big fighter, but we see it through her eyes and feelings. Yeah, that's the thing, is that the main character is not a fighter at all. In this case, she is being sort of protected and escorted by this uh, elf prince. He's the real fighter. So a lot of what happens um, is her. she does end up getting involved and her life is indeed in danger, but she's not the one doing a lot of the fighting. She obviously is the one that kills the monster with the iron ring. But these scenes still really work because we, she cares about him and comes to care about him. And it's not like we're watching two people fight that she has no opinion on either of them. Eventually, she starts to sort of root for him and they begin to fall in love. So it can totally still work for, you know, your character doesn't have to be the one fighting all the time. Um, if they're invested in what's going on, if it concerns them, and if it affects them, then it can still totally work as a scene. We have a question. When does not the boot camp starts? I can see week two in the events, but on July 1st, but not week one. I thought that was week one on July 1st. Let me double check. Uh, oh, it's, there's no slide for it. Nacho, do you think you can paste the list of upcoming classes into the chat? Week zero is July 9th. Wait, how can we? Okay, so week zero is July 9th. Week one is July 16th. I guess maybe the events might be not correct at the moment, but hopefully that's helpful for you. Okay, so um, we're going to wrap up here. Um, definitely come by lab later today if you're a member. If you're not a member and would like to sign up, scriptcamp.net slash membership. You can sign up for your free trial. Two weeks access to every single thing that we do here, over 100 hours of events per month. Um, and you can attend labs, access the video library, advanced lab, and many other member exclusive events on the server. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, we hope to see you soon for your next script, ca script camp class or event, uh, such as the one tomorrow morning. Um, have a great rest of your Saturday.